Good morning, everyone. Those in the back, please have a seat. Welcome. It's nice to uh, see everyone here, bright and early. Um, I'm Scott Zackheim, a general partner at Landmark Ventures. I run our digital marketing technology practice. Uh, welcome to the ninth annual Media Technology Summit. Um, Mets fans who are here, Zeev, thanks for being here at 9 a.m. I'm sorry, guys. I know it's a bit of a hangover, so it's great to have you out as well. Um, a lot of faces that I recognize, a lot of folks here that I have met with. We go out to breakfast at Pershing Square. We talk on the phone. I email you incessantly just for the fun of it. Um, so, so thanks so much for uh, coming out. You guys are all now part of the Landmark family. Um, we look forward to hosting you uh, at many more events in the future. Uh, as you know about Landmark, once you're in the family, there's, there's really no getting out. Um, when, I, when I talk to peers about the Landmark's events and what we do, it's really, I liken it to bringing our Rolodex out to life. Um, we, we bring out the best of Landmark. We intermediate on a daily basis between innovators and deal makers. Um, but today we give you a platform to engage, to network, to connect, to deal make in person, um, organically. Um, before we jump in, uh, a big shout out of appreciation to Landmark's events team. Um, they've curated a tremendous day, really beautiful mix of content, subject matter, dialogue, endless networking and creative networking formats. Uh, and, and for those of you who are here for haagen -Dazs and, and coffee and snacks, we got a lot of that for you as well. So let's talk about today, as, as I am your pilot for, for the rest of the day, harnessing the power of digital engagement. What the heck does that mean? Now, as you guys all know well, the digital world moves at warp speed. But more, more important to us and those who we talk about this every day, it's the consumer expectation for, for digital that moves even faster. And so how the heck do we keep up? How do we prepare ourselves for a digital world that will um, move even faster going forward? Uh, we'll touch on an array of subjects today. Uh, and as you can see from the nice glossy agenda, um, we'll get into the future. Uh, but what I like about what we're doing today is we'll get into today, what's really practical. Um, of course, we'll get into what's next, bots and AR and VR and AI and every other futuristic acronym you can think of. But for those of you CMOs, CDOs, folks who are thinking about how to engage with a consumer today on digital, it's really about how do we keep up, how do we engage with the digital revolution, while also really hanging on to what's important to our brand. Um, so just so you get a sense of where we're going, we're going to cover experience, marketing, content and social, obviously, data and analytics, e-commerce. Uh, and if you've kind of studied the agenda already, uh, you'll know that this is kind of like your local 11 o'clock news on steroids. Uh, we're covering the consumer. We're covering business today. We're covering sports. We're covering politics. Uh, we're even covering the weather, thanks to our good friends at AccuWeather. So we, we really have you covered through the news cycle. Um, one last reminder for everyone before we jump into our awesome first panel. Let's have fun today and, and, and what we do here at Landmark, it's really about the networking. It's about the relationships that we grow out of events like this. That's why you're all here. So enjoy it and, and seek each other out for, for further dialogue. So we start with a Whopper, a real fun one, um, the new era of strategic brand partnerships. How are brands confronting the digital age, globalization, hyper-localization, not just with the consumer, um, but when they engage each other. Um, we have three iconic brands here uh, to talk about how they're doing it and how they've successfully made the leap into the digital age. Chris Pantoya, Senior Vice President, Mo Mobile Strategy and Partnerships at the MBA. Dave Madden, Senior Vice President, Global Brand Partnerships at EA. Jack Daly, Head of Digital Strategy at Under Armour. Come on up. Where do you want us? I'm going to take that one. Thanks. How do you want to do it? OK. I think we're good. <laughs> so before I jump into the questions that, that we've uh, laid out for you guys, I really wanted to get opening, opening remarks. I don't know if everyone's familiar with the show. Sports Reporters used to be hosted by Dick Schapp on ESPN. But he always starts with opening remarks and ends with parting shots. And so we're going to do that. Um, we'll start at the end. Um, Dave, what's on your mind this morning? Well, I'll start with a question. Anybody play video games in the, in the crowd here? Anybody in the audience? Okay. 
Anybody have kids that play video games in the audience? Okay. All right, so pretty, pretty good crowd uh, for understanding. Anybody that didn't raise their hand has played Candy Crush. You can raise your hand now. <laughs> All right, thank you. So video games are, are, are fairly broad in terms of who's playing them these days. We used to think it was kids in the basement playing uh, you know, with the lights down and uh, kind of hardcore games for hours at a time. The reality is what's happened in video games is that it's very broad on a global basis and mobile has exploded the potential audience for who can be engaged with a video game. New uh, areas that are exciting that we'll probably explore a little bit today are esports or competitive gaming is what we like to call it at EA but sort of the mediaization of video games and the broadcasting of gameplay and tournaments and prizing and stadiums that are starting to mirror real world sports but happening around video games. And so, a ton of exciting things going on and all that leads to really great opportunities for brands to work together with EA. Thanks. Jack, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so um, my day to day, I'm, I'm spending my time um, figuring out a way to connect Under Armour's brand and product messages to a millennial target, which means that uh, finding the spaces where they're consuming, you know, they're not consuming advertising in traditional spaces anymore. They're either avoiding it or ignoring it even when it's in front of them, right? Which means finding opportunities to put your brand message in the places where they are paying attention to. Uh, I think of kind of brand partnerships um, as a great way to connect your message to consumers in the places where they're not, um, where they're going for content and experience and not advertising, uh, I think that raises, it raises the bar on the quality of the experiences that you put in front of them because um, it's kind of, you're, you're not, you're not um, it's not an advertisement outside the All right, so we are just under three weeks away from the tip off of the 71st uh, NBA season and so we're excited. We uh, ended with a bang, I would say. All yeah. right. So we got some basketball fans in the audience, that's awesome. Uh, but I, I really think one of the things that we're thinking a lot about is as our brand becomes a much more internationally consumed sport, uh, we really do have to use technology and digital and brand partnerships. Of course, we're, we're all brand partners up here, so that's exciting to be together. Um, but we really have to use that to reach our audience that's changing and evolving the way that they want to consume the content and the experiences. And I would say, um, you know, one of the things, for example, that we'll talk a little more about is virtual reality. You know, less than 1% of our fans worldwide ever attend a live game. And so bringing the game and the players closer to them is really important to us. So I'm looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, so let, let's dig in right there. And any one of you can, can jump in on the first question. But now, how have these brand partnerships that you've spoken to already taken on a different persona as, as we've gone digital? Um, how have they gone beyond co-branding and signage and advertising and events partnerships and sponsorships, uh, what does it really look like when, when you guys all engage with each other? Well, yeah, I'm, I can start us off. I, one of the, the relationships, and I know we'll talk about uh, the EA and Under Armour relationships we have, but uh, another one that I think is really interesting is that we recently uh, did an agreement with Verizon, a multi-year partnership. And one of the things that they're doing that I think embodies this, which is they've kind of taken a 360 degree view of their partnership with us. And they even said to us, you know, it's not just about signage and courtside and this kind of thing, but we want something much more. And so as one example, they are our uh, slam dunk partner. And so every year at All Star, of course, we've got slam dunk, which um, this past year was just uh, off the charts as far as the following on that. And what they did was not only did they have the branding, but they also had content that was being created real time at the event that they were able to share on their platform exclusively. And so all of a sudden they were connecting their sponsorship to the content they could share. And then lastly, the other thing they did to associate themselves with Dunk was they actually did a campaign with their consumers called uh, Data Dunks. And so fans that were also consumers of Verizon services were able to pick five players throughout the season that they thought would Dunk. And every time that player dunked, the consumer actually got free data added to their Verizon bill. So again, I think just that 360 degree, not just about signage, but how do you, in, you know, incorporate the content and the experiences and the engagement of the content. And so I think that's a good that's example great. of that. Any other examples you guys want to speak to? I mean, I think Chris hit on an interesting point when she talked about rewarding the consumer when they picked the right number of dunks and they got uh, extra time. 
our a kind of philosophy we have, and, and it's sort of in line with what's going on in the digital world today, is consumers have a lot of choices in terms of what they consume, where they consume it, how they consume it. And our philosophy on partnering is it definitely uh, still, Scott, in, in enjoys the ability to do promotions and use each other's uh, influencers and, and get out in the marketplace and, and put things together that get scale. But the most important element of a partnership is really around engagement. It's about engaging our fans, our players, our consumers to reward them with something that delights and surprises them in a way they actually couldn't get it otherwise. And so the best partnerships that we're engaging on today across a variety of title sports and non-sports are really ones that help unlock special things in the gameplay that consumers otherwise have to journey through, you know, have to earn their way through through either play or purchase. So a good example would be uh, right now with FIFA, which is our, our global football slash soccer game uh, that's played all around the world on HD consoles as well as mobile, is we're partnered with Coca-Cola in a way that uh, rewards consumers when they go into a you know, Walmart, Target, 7-Eleven and engage with a, with a FIFA promotion with Coca-Cola. There's actually under the cap codes and, and uh, tear off codes that unlock special players in the game that are rewarded only through the partnership. And so that kind of example drives excitement for our game, but it also drives excitement for our partner. Most importantly, the consumer, the player, is the one that wins in the end. So they're getting something that's really beneficial to them. And that's sort of the metric that we try and, try and use across all of our partnerships. Yeah, so to, to piggyback off that, you know, it's all, as a brand, it's all about creating value for your consumer. And if you're going to integrate inside, uh, I'll use a video game example. Um, if you're going to integrate inside of a game, um, don't get in the way of what the consumer is there to do. Uh, make the experience better, right? So uh, Steph Curry is an Under Armour athlete. Uh, there was some press towards the end of last season, which was a historic one for him, about how um, his, his stats in real life, he was actually performing better than the video game Steph Curry in NBA 2K. <laughs> so uh, when he won his back-to-back -back and I think the first unanimous uh, MVP, we actually partnered with NBA 2K, and for um, a window of time, uh, they cranked up Steph Curry's stats, like his, his abilities in the game, to 99, which is the tops, which basically means he, make, he made every shot, right? Uh, so uh, great stunt within the game. Players loved it. Uh, I think another valuable piece to add there is that when we look at these partnerships, we always look at not just the value of the um, activation with the consumer, say, in this case, in the game, but also the press and um, uh, user-generated content or conversation that that's going to generate. So um, you know, it sounds like we're going to talk a little bit about, about eSports, but you know, when, when you do that, when you crank up a player's rank, ranking to 99 and they're making half-court shots all the time, it's amazing how much of that footage ends up on YouTube and how much they're talking about it. So it's a great way to kind of further tie uh, Under Armour to that marquee athlete at a... At a yeah, that's moment. a really nice segue to the next question in terms of the content itself. Um, it, it seems like with the you know, evolution of digital, um, as brands are being forced to become publishers of content, uh, how do these partnerships that you're forming become more or maybe less important? I think, so I, I would say that, you know, um, you're just, we're always chasing attention, right? So. If you're um, placing content in a news feed or uh, Snapchat, Discover, wherever the you know all of the places where you know our target is um, call it 12 to 24, all of the places where they're consuming media and content uh, are places where they don't need to pay any attention to you, right? They're, you're not competing with I'm not competing with other apparel brands, right? I'm competing with everything that's in their news feed, right? So uh, to me the you know, the, the value of the brand partnership is that it just creates unique opportunities to create content that um, a consumer hasn't seen before. And, and you always talk about um, thumb stopping. You know, it's like they're, they're scrolling, they're scrolling. Sure. How do you get them to just stop and look, right? Because that's the easiest thing to do is um, just pass over your content, even when you're in a lot of these places, even when you're paying to put it there, right? So. Yeah. Um, I want to pivot a bit um, to the notion of globalization, and Chris, I'd love to get your perspective, because uh, I think the NBA um, is the best at this, quite frankly. I think the NFL is trying to get there, but you guys um, take the cake. Uh, looking at um, globalization, or really a shrinking globe, 
Um, how do you look at strategic partnerships and brand partnerships through the lens of globalization? Um, and how important is it to stay in market versus just be a globalized brand? Yeah, I think it's a great question. Um, you know, one of the things to share a little bit of background on the NBA, um, we actually have a uh, hundred players in the league that are from countries outside of the U.S., which is about a quarter of all of our players. And I think that sometimes surprises people. But when you think about Ginobili, the Gasol brothers, you know, pretty quickly Ben Simmons, uh, which will be exciting this season, you know, you start to realize that it's a very international league, starting from the players up. Um, the other thing that we do is we spend a lot of energy in markets with grassroots. And so we do the junior NBA programs because we believe that the more people actually play the game, the more they tend to become lifelong fans. And so that's really important for us to also spread the game and the fitness that comes with it, of course, you know. Um, but, but all of that said, I think we really try to balance um, both global partners as well as local partners. And so, you know, the example I would use is when you think about our global partners, very often those are the partners that are helping us amplify all of our digital content and really kind of get the game out there. Uh, we broadcast games in 220 markets in 49 languages. And so, you know, we need brand partners to help us do that and distribution partners to help us do that. On the local side, some of what we focus on is really working with our brand partners that are more local in nature to help us localize the stories that we tell, to localize um, actually live events, such as you know our three-on-three -three tournaments that we will do in a local country, our elite camps for youth, as well as our junior NBA. And so we'll really try to, we try to balance between both global partners and local partners. Um, and I think, again, on the, the local side, one of the things that's really important is the in-language, the culturally relevant stories, you know, obviously, when you think about uh, the Gasol brothers um, resonate big time in Spain, you know, Dirk in, in Germany. And so we really do try to tailor our stories and so forth with our brand partners to each of the local markets. Do you guys have anything you wanted to add on? Yeah, I, I would say that the interesting phenomenon that's going on in gaming is around two components. One is mobile gaming. When a game launches mobily, it can launch everywhere, essentially everywhere in the world. And when that happens, your audience overnight can be huge. Who's familiar with the Pokemon phenomenon? And mm -hmm. probably some players here. I know hopefully no one walked into a wall or anything while they were playing. But people did all around the world, all simultaneously. And all of a sudden, that game had 100 million or more installs overnight. And that's, that's an experience that's happening for EA across our, uh, our titles that we're doing both mobile and console with, which is you can get to a broader audience. The business model is very different. It's free. The game costs nothing to get on your device. It's actually the incremental content that you might end up spending money on or being rewarded from a brand partner with it. But the globalization of mobile gaming opens up not only new markets, but a trove of data. So when we partner with sports leagues like the NBA, and we have uh, players playing our NBA Live mobile game all around the world, and it's a really successful game right now, we can also look at where, what markets they're playing, what teams they're interested in, what players they want to play with, what color uniforms. Uh, what types of shoes they're wearing, all the kind of information that our partners would love to see, but also helps inform us to not only make a better game, but also who to partner with and what are the key elements we, wanna, we want our partner around. The second is video, and it's, uh, Jack mentioned it, but what's going on with the, 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 the video experience tied to video gaming is pretty phenomenal. So does anybody have uh, 12 to 15-year-old kids here in the room? Okay. Do they play FIFA, the video game? Okay. How, when they're not playing FIFA the video game, what are they doing? They're, are they on YouTube watching videos of people playing FIFA the video game? Yeah, it's absolutely mind-boggling the amount of time spent watching influencers who are really good at the games by this generation. We've kind of, uh, I don't know if this is an official term or not, but we started to use the term internally, Generation C. They're connected. They are very creative. So these are the kids that are creating content on a, on a consistent basis and they're also um, very collaborative. They, they do things together with other people. And this Generation C is really driving this experience that takes people from mobile to console to uh, YouTube and other video channels like Twitch. And it creates this incredibly powerful experience around uh, great brands and great franchises that can expand globally overnight. So that's the, sort of what's going on in, uh, and, and then leading to the potential to work both with partners like the leagues and uh, Under Armour, where they have uh, great investments and uh, content and athletes and influencers, it all kinds of comes together in a pretty interesting way to partner. 
Dave, let's stay with you for a second. Let's, let's talk a little bit and, and bring us up to speed on professional gaming um, and, and what that means to you guys. Uh, how partnerships have changed around it, Major League Gaming, um, I know in Turner, the E-League. Um, there's a lot going on here. And to be honest, I can't get my hands around it, so it'd be, it'd be great to get your perspective. I can't get my hands around it either. It's happening everywhere <coughs> around the globe simultaneously. We have uh, sports teams signing professional gamers. We have venture capital firms signing professional game teams. Uh, EA ourselves have announced that we've got both FIFA and Madden tournament series set up for the season. We've built the technology into the HD games, the console games that you can play in during the week into a weekend tournament. If you do well in the weekend tournament, you can apply into a regional tournament. If you do well at the regional tournament, you can actually be um, brought out to an actual physical event that's going to be broadcast both on the internet and on, on TV. And ultimately, there's a lot of prize money involved. So um, I, I was at a really exciting event we did with the MLS a couple weeks ago at the All-Star Game a, a month ago in San Jose, where a 14-year-old who came out of his basement was competing against a professional gamer. And he's there. And his mom is going absolutely insane. He made it all the way to the finals. Wow. And that was just a, a play-in tournament that started with 90,000 people in the online uh, experience in the FIFA game and culminated with a 14 year old playing against a pro and so it's opening a lot of opportunities for people and also um, driving a much deeper engagement in the experience because now everybody has a chance to be a pro and to be a winner and it's pretty pretty exciting the dynamic that's happening around that but Scott to your point it's also a bit of the Wild West with just the investments that are going on right now and, yeah. and people hedging bets. I'm glad it didn't exist when I was in high school. I, w I would never have made it to college. That <laughs> exactly. is, it's scary. I'd love um, to tack on to that. Yeah, go as, ahead. As a, as a brand, so we're, we're um, just winding down a uh, campaign that's been, you know, that started this summer, very much focused on driving greater awareness of Under Armour as a footwear brand, right? I think, you know, people think of us as a, you know, base layer and apparel, right? Uh, we've been in the uh, footwear game for a while now and trying to drive greater awareness of not just the quality of our shoes, but also the athletes that are wearing them, right? So we have a Cam Newton campaign that launched at the beginning of the NFL season. And, and of course, kids are seeing Cam wearing our cleats in our ads, and they're seeing it uh, on the field in the pregame. Uh, you know, we found that uh, gaming is another environment for us to connect with that kid around that same point. So we're actually doing some work with Madden right now. We're uh, creating these kind of branded segments that are uh, showcasing great footwork plays, but from within Madden, right? So for our target consumer, they, they see that as as valid an expression of the game as watching the game on Sunday afternoon. It's really interesting. So let's stay with you, Jack, for a second. Um, Want to understand how Under Armour is uh, approaching their strategic partnerships as you evolve from a shirts and shoes brand uh, and, and really move into this um, fitness lifestyle brand. Um, I know there's a ton you're doing, acquisitions you're making, um, and so let's, let's hear about how that has played out. Sure, so yeah, I actually joined the company uh, a little over a year ago uh, and was working on our Connected Fitness business. Uh, Connected Fitness is a digital division of the company comprised of, uh, at the time it was three apps that we had acquired, um, My, Matt My Fitness, uh, which is a run cycling tracking app, my Fitness Pal, which is a nutrition tracking app, and then Endomondo, which is similar to Map My Fitness, but with a very large European audience. Uh, banded those together to create uh, world's largest health and fitness community. I think we're about 180 million registered users now across the globe. Uh, and in January, we launched our first connected hardware a product called Healthbox, which is a, a bundle with a, a digital scale, a wrist wearable, and a heart rate monitor. There's a new app called Record that launched with, with that product. There's essentially a dashboard for your health, and it sits at the center of our hardware, partner hardware, because we're an open platform. So if you have a Fitbit, you can connect that as well, as well as all of the software that we already had. So if you were tracking your um, runs on Map My Fitness, uh, that data would feed into Record, right? So we're creating an experience for consumers. We're saying, you know, Under Armour as a brand has uh, helped you uh, perform better on the field historically through apparel, now we're doing it through technology and data, right? So uh, from a partnership point of view, you know, I think one of the most interest, interesting things we did with Record is partnered with IBM Watson to essentially give them, let them crunch a lot of the data, and we're collecting data from you know, tens of millions of consumers, right? Let them crunch the data, 
your data, everybody's data, and surface up insights. That's why you're using the app, right? The value to you in opening up record every day is that it gives you some insight into your own health and fitness, right? So that partnership, partnership with Watson allowed us to surface up insights that said, you know, people like you, so people your age, gender, right? Uh, this is how much sleep they get per night, right? You should be sleeping more, right? Making those kinds of recommendations to you, uh, it made the experience more valuable. And you know, when you're in the software game, it's all about it's all about retention, right? How do you get you know how do you get that app to the first screen on your phone? How do you make it a behavior that uh, every morning you wake up and open that thing up and check how you slept last night, right? Uh, so the more value that we can add to that experience the better, and so IBM's been a great partner to just enrich the experience, and obviously, you know, I always think of these brand partnerships as um, you're looking for, you know, mutually beneficial uh, partnerships, right? And so, great way for them to, uh, in a very tangible way, surface what they're able to do with that technology. You know, Wait, I'll go ahead. Yeah. To that point, I, one of the things you said earlier was, you know, making sure that as a brand, you don't get in the way of the experience. And I think um, Under Armour actually, together with the NBA, has done that very effectively in the NBA Fit app, um, where basically for people that are NBA fans and follow the NBA, but are also fitness focused and want to keep track of their fitness levels, as well as their activities, um, the app actually provides content with some of our NBA and WNBA players talking about training tips and so forth. And so, you know, just a little bit different spin for NBA enthusiasts. Right. And, you know, so I think that's a great example of being authentic to what the Under Armour brand is about, you know, talking authentically to NBA fans. And, and that's a, a real natural partnership and a real natural outcome of that partnership. So I think that gets back to your, you know, don't get in the way of the experience, Absolutely. simply enhance it. I think the NBA Fit app is a great example of, um, you know, we record is um, its utility for you and it's, and it's taking all that functionality and adding this layer that, you know, your fans are obviously um, going to gravitate to. It makes the experience richer for them. It brings in a new audience for us. It's really, you know, it's an interesting um, partnership. It's great. That's great. Nice segue. Before we get into parting shots, uh, one last question. Um, beyond social media engagement, obviously, Snapchat, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, I mean, you guys use, use these channels. Uh, how, give us examples of other ways you're, you're engaging your fan bases, your, your consumers, uh, and engaging each other. Um, and feel free to kind of go, go with whatever route you want to go here. You know, I would say, uh, you know, the NBA has been extremely active in regards to social. And so we actually, um, I guess back in February, we surpassed 1 billion followers worldwide. And so we became the um, first pro sports league worldwide to actually do that. And, you know, a lot of people ask the question, are you doing that at the expense of your broadcast viewers? Are you doing that at the expense of something else somewhere else, you know? And how do you put that much free content out there without, you know, then losing it elsewhere in revenue? And one of the things I would say is, you know, because we have really gone at the social channels in a way, or every platform that we're engaged with in a way that the fans want to consume it. So there are certain things that you do on Facebook that you would never do on Twitter. And there are certain things on Twitter that you would never do on Snapchat. And really understanding that as to how fans want to consume on each of those platforms. And then what we've seen is actually the outcome has been that last season, we actually hit um, all-time highs on our viewing. And we actually, during the finals, I believe we had you know, the third most viewed game in game seven. And that's as compared to the Jordan era when there was a lot less option to, uh, to watch other things, right? And so I think it's exciting because I think if you can speak authentically by platform and the way in which each platform, whether social, whether digital streaming type platforms, or broadcast, you know, um, it, it puts a lot of impetus on the partners and on the distribution mechanisms to be differentiated. And I think, you know, even ESPN and Turner, our, you know, long time, 20 to 40 year kind of relationships that we've had between the two of them, um, it's really important because they're always evolving. Uh, Turner, most recently, one of the things they did with us last season was they streamed the first ever uh, live VR game. And so there we were in virtual reality, and I think there's only more to come this season. But I think it really puts the impetus on the brand and the entity to continue to innovate, continue to be natural to the different platforms that exist. But then listen to the fan, because the fan will always tell you where they want to consume you and how they want to consume you. And the appetite becomes insatiable at that point, that they will find you and they will consume more and more if you do those things, I believe. 
Go ahead. Well, I, I think the, uh, the thought of social originally for a lot of companies and marketers, including EA, was let's create a bunch of social content and put it out there. Let's have our ad agency build it, perfect it. It's different than a TV commercial, but we're going we're gonna to be the creators of it. And I think the evolution that's happening that's making that overall platform of social so exciting is we're turning all of our players into creators and broadcasters. We're putting the technology into the games to allow them to broadcast out to their fans, helping them build fan bases, creating tournament structures for them to be successful. But most importantly, what we're seeing is some of the best commercial content, promotional content for our games is being created by our players. There's hilarious stuff on YouTube right now where people have taken the best celebration modes in Madden and scored it to music. And you've got you know, all these great dance celebrations in the end zone and on tackles and the, the, the viewers on this, the viewership on this stuff is millions of viewers and it's just amazing what the platform has enabled. So what's, with the big shift, and we still make great trailers and spots for our games, but what we're seeing is the, the flow of content is really going out to our players and they're becoming the big influencers and they're becoming our marketing channel and we're giving them the tools to do it. So I think that's the big, the big shift for us. Jack, go ahead and we'll make this your parting shot because we're counting down cool. here and this thing might explode. I know we got, a, we got a shot clock. Uh, yeah, so I, I mean, I think the, you start to talk about um, influencers. I think for us, it's, it's just broadening the, the definition of what a brand partnership is, what a brand is, right? So um, I think you know, we just launched UAS, which is our first foray into fashion, right? So it's not, it's not a on-field performance wear, right? We worked with uh, Tim Coppins, who is a um, you know, who is a real reputable uh, designer in that space to have him kind of creative direct the line, right? That's a, that's a brand partnership. We, coming into the, to UAS, that's not a space that we've played in before, right? So we don't have endemic credibility, right? But Tim does, right? So we're kind of drafting off that credibility and giving him an opportunity to do something bigger, right? Uh, and, and then on the other end of the spectrum, The Rock, right? So our sports marketing department uh, you, you, know, you, you know all of the um, big athletes that we have, Steph Curry, Cam Newton, Jordan Spieth, et cetera, right? Uh, you know, we've got to deal with The Rock now. The Rock has 100 million followers. World. He might be the most popular guy in the world, right? <laughs> he's got a global audience. He's got a large female audience. He, uh, from, a, from a content partnership point of view, gives us a great in with an audience that we're trying to reach. So uh, just even thinking non-traditionally about what a brand is and, and what that means. Great, so we have, we're gonna go one more minute, 30 seconds, what, what's next? Uh, I would just say more and more looking to where the consumer is headed and the things that interest them and how we engage them on those fronts. I think always kind of being one step ahead of it, not being afraid of trying some things and failing and then very quickly learning and adjusting and, and trying it again. Dave, last word. Uh, global, one word, global. Fantastic, thanks so much. Really appreciate it, and we'll look forward to hosting you guys again.